But I'll tell you what, when I'm done, my biceps are humongous. Humongous. My name is Anthony Bevilacqua, and I'm the host of New York Muscle Radio Podcast. My arms have been a weak point for years. When I started training, my arms measured 11 inches. Even after many years of hardcore training, nothing would get them to grow. With the help of my co-host, Big E, we set out on a mission to gain one solid inch to my arms in 12 weeks. In the greatest experiment of all. 12 weeks later, this program finally helped me get 18 inch arms. The 12 week arm experiment, the ultimate arm growth program, ebook, the audio book, and the workout video. Pick up your copy now on NewYorkMuscleRadio.com. New York's very own muscle building coaches, Anthony Bevilacqua and Pete Kacharian, proudly present to you New York Muscle Radio. What's up, guys? New York Muscle Radio, episode number 138, Blood Work for Body Composition and Fitness. Today's topic is going to be a really, really cool one, so definitely something different. We have on one of our clients who's actually a medical doctor. He's going to come on, diagnose blood work, and teach you what to look for in all your blood results and what you should get out of going to the doctor and getting all this stuff checked. But again, if you're a new listener, welcome to the best muscle building and fat burning radio show on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, wherever you're listening to this, this is the best one right here. Uh, my name is Anthony Bevilacqua. My co-host right here, Big Pikachu, and big guy. What's up there? You excited to get your blood work read? Oh, man. I mean, if somebody can actually interpret the stuff that's on my blood work and give me a clear-cut answer, there would be like, uh, it'll be a gift, you know, because I was talking to you about this and so many doctors out there just... You know, they, they just look at stuff on a piece of paper and they don't really understand what's going on outside uh, in everyday life, what's going on inside your body. And they just look at the paper and they just say, OK, you know what? This is a little high. Uh, stop eating so much or clean up your diet. You know, so I think a lot of people listening to this episode who can relate to the fitness lifestyle and just nutrition and wanting to be optimal with everything will get a lot out of this and Hopefully, if they're not getting it from their doctor and they need a second opinion and they want to hear from a doctor that we're bringing on board that can help out, they'll, they'll definitely get a lot out of this episode. Yeah, this guy's the best. So I'm super excited to have him on and, uh, yeah, go over that stuff. I mean, it sounds a little boring, blood work, but, you know, it, it, it's so interesting. I find it to be so interesting. So I'm excited to. Yeah, me too, you know, man. And the funny thing is we actually sent him our blood work. You know, me and Pete, we're pretty much up on all this stuff. So we sent him our blood work. So now we can. Uh, I'm kind of like holding my breath here to see what he has to say. Like he's going to diagnose us and see which one of us yeah. is going to get bigger. Well, he's going to also tell us which one of us is going to die first. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. So, you know, we're kind of getting a little personal. You guys are going to know our personal numbers here, you know? Yeah. Like remember the podcast you almost gave out your phone number? Yeah, I'm giving out my, uh, my blood work numbers here on this one. <laughs> yeah. This one is not getting muted. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. So excited for this. But again... Guys, the Black Friday sale sale is still on. I believe today today is Monday, so this is going to be the last day. It's Cyber Monday, so the last day you can head on over to NewYorkMuscleRadio.com, take advantage of our Black Friday sale. You have a special on coffee and a fifty percent off on coaching. So head on over there. Today is the last day. Tuesday that will that page will no longer be around. So head on over there and pick that up now. Again, guys, if you haven't also subscribe to our YouTube channel, you can watch this video. Uh, it's, you can go to newyorkmuscleradio.com slash video and you can subscribe and watch some stuff there. Big guy, what else is going on, man? How was your, uh, Thanksgiving holiday weekend? Did you have a lot of leftovers? It was good. Uh, actually I had one meal on Thanksgiving. Then I had dessert, you know, I, that's, I don't know how, if everybody does it this way, but in, in New York, uh, this is definitely the way we do it is we have the big Thanksgiving meal, then Three or four hours later, it's dessert time. You know, space it out. Uh, so I had my big meal, uh, dessert. I didn't go crazy with the dessert. And then before bed, I had my round of seconds. And I'm happy to say I woke up the next day half a pound lighter. So did something right. Yeah, I had my uh, my Thanksgiving. And then, to, well, today we're recording this on a Friday. But um, the day after Thanksgiving, I uh, I had my first plate of my leftovers so I actually fasted. I was just super busy. I had work, you know, in the morning, super early. You know, and hats off to my clients who come super early in the morning like that, especially the day after a holiday. So um, trained all my clients. I worked until like one, one thirty, 
And I sat down and ate. I fasted all the way until that time. Don't ask me why. I just did. I was working straight through, so it was easier. Fasted. Had my second plate of leftovers, and I'm starving right now. So I'm probably gonna go do that as soon as we uh, get off this. But I love turkey. Period. So. Yeah, turkey. Speaking, of, never which, go wrong, speaking yeah. of which, let's look. Let's look up in my fitness pal what the macros are for turkey. Because I'm curious. Because I have to put it in my fitness pal anyway. Do you? What do you type in? So for something like like turkey. What will you type in? Well, it depends how you how you make it, you know, because you get some well, people that like to. No, nah, I deep know, fry? but I mean, you know, some people. Yeah, exactly. You could deep fry your turkey. A lot I heard people, that's amazing. I've heard that is too, but it also could kill you. <laughs> not not yeah, if you, yeah, not yeah. if you eat it, but it could literally <laughs> explode and kill you. Uh, <laughs> All right, so let's see. So I'm gonna put this in my fitness pal. Let's see. let's type in um, white meat turkey baked. Because it was in the yeah, oven. Yeah, baked in right? the oven. Yeah. So let's see baked. Let's see what comes up on my fitness pal. Um. And I like ounces. Oh, USDA nutritional guide. Baked turkey, four ounces. And four ounces of baked turkey is 16 grams of protein and four fat. Sounds about right. And perfect. I could put it in one ounce. I had seven ounces before. So I had... Yeah. Wait, and, that's you know, secret. especially on, on uh, Thanksgiving, don't go crazy measuring, you know, the difference between white meat and dark meat. And if you have a little bit of extra uh, gravy on there, you know, if you're not yeah. if, if you're not adding anything significant to it on Thanksgiving for the one meal... That that's that's my new details. Ill man, I measured out my food before. Seven ounces of turkey breast has only twenty eight grams of protein. I thought it was way more. I stopped at seven. I'm like, no, oh, that can't be, be right. Seven ounces only has how many grams of protein? Twenty eight. No so way, right? What is, what is right, that per is, gram? That's like nothing. There's no way that's so per right. Per gram. Hold on, wait. Per gram. Four. No, that's yeah, not no way. Right. That's All right, not so right. that's wrong. So let's see, guys, see this is why here. you have to be uh, on top of it when you when you check out stuff on my fitness pal. It's not always accurate. All right, so this, yeah, so this one, let's it's see, gonna seven have, ounces. It's going to have close to seven eight grams of protein per ounce. Yeah, so this one, according to this, one gram and uh, one ounce has six point two grams of protein and point eight fat. That sound right? It's definitely closer. Again, it, it's all going to depend. You know, if you're if you're looking for a hundred percent accuracy, it would depend if it's white meat, if it's dark meat. Um, you know, yeah, obviously, one, if it's one. raw or if it's cooked, um, you know, the, the numbers are going to vary a little bit. This one's probably right. One ounce is 8.7. Yeah, that sounds right. All right, so good. So I had seven seven ounces, so that's 61 grams of protein. That sounds about right. Yeah, yeah. It's going to – all all um lean protein like meat, like chicken, your turkey and everything, it's going to have around eight grams of protein per ounce. You know, if you see so anything see. significantly different, it's definitely not right. So let's see. I also had like a cranberry stuffing. So let's put that in. Let's see. Oh, cranberry stuffing right here. Five ounces. I didn't measure this. So I would assume five ounces is a serving. It's 36 carbs, two protein, one fat. Probably a little higher on the fat, but I'll add that in just to be sure. And then let's see some turkey gravy. Let's see what comes up. I'm just curious. That's all you turkey. ate? Yeah, turkey, that and Turkey, that. cranberry, and uh, gravy? Turkey, no. Turkey stuffing, gravy. This is what I just had right now. Okay. Um, let's see. Gravy. One ounce is 18 calories that's probably definitely a little more fat than that but whatever i mean you guys get the idea and again it's good it's good to track he's tracking loosely right now it's good to track loosely um you know one if it's thanksgiving it's good to track a little loosely um it's one day one meal Um, but also when you're in the extended off season or a gaining phase uh if you guys are dieting trying to lose weight you definitely want to be a little bit more strict about it than the way we're doing it right now but like I said yeah, bro- in the previous podcast, when you get to a certain point and you're more in that maintenance phase, it's okay to be a little bit loose with the tracking. Don't go crazy with it. Yeah, I had and I had here about half a cup of roasted potatoes. So there, there you go. See, just once you get the stuff in your My Fitness Pal, it's not so horrible, you know. But it's, it, again, it's finding the right thing because My Fitness Pal has so many different options. You have to really look. Yeah, you have and to use attention. common sense too. You know, if the if you're having something that you know you cooked it yourself, you know there was so much more fat in it, and you see it only has one gram. I mean. You can kind of <laughs> de- get rid of that one, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's like one where it's like, uh, you know, you add one tablespoon, but, you know, you did like a like a triple heaping tablespoon scoop. It's like that's not really a tablespoon, even though you, you think it is. Exactly. All right, let's move on to the New York Muscle Radio trending topics. I mean, I was excited about this one, the last, the, the first one with the semen smoothies, but uh, mm-hmm. this is far from the semen smoothies. I just thought this was a cool, we got a listener question in, so, and we actually answer another listener question with uh our doctor, the New York Muscle Radio doctor, that's what we're going to coin Austin as, New York Muscle Radio he's fitness the, he's doctor. He's the official doctor, yes. Yeah, the official fitness doctor of New York Muscle Radio, Austin. Um, anyway, we answered the listener question of the day with him because that was more uh, related. But the trending topic today, and this is another listener question, but I think it's just cool, so I put it in again here. So this listener is from South Africa. So 
this is this is cool. That's really on mm-hmm. the other side of the world. And South Africa is where Arnold and Lou went in Pumping Iron. Pretoria, <laughs> yes. Yeah, Pretoria, South Africa. Do you like them with with brown hair? I like them with big hair, brown hair, with big, big ass, breasts, little, little ass. breast. As long as their personality is charming. I love the part when Lou Ferrigno is posing and the cheetah is licking his leg. And the guy's like, holy cow. <laughs> and then you got his dad in the background. Louie, flex your muscles. <laughs> Tense your muscles a little bit. Pull your stomach in. Yeah. South Africa, I heard it's beautiful, man. I really did. I heard it's beautiful. Over there. I heard the food is amazing. I would love to go one day. I, first of all, I want to go to Africa for a safari. That's one. Yeah. I have to. That's like yeah. one of my bucket list of things I do. Yeah, man, my my bucket list is when I when I, you know, it's funny because I'm getting older. I got to get this done soon, but I, I want to spend some time traveling, and that definitely will be on the on the bucket list. I still have, I still don't even have my passport, man. Dude, like I told you so many times, you, you have leather pants, mm-hmm. you have a full hook. There's something wrong with you. There is something wrong. All right, <clears throat> you've never traveled either. Anyway, let's get on to the question before we depress everybody on your on your pathetic life. <laughs> you've really never traveled anywhere, man. I've never been outside the states. Come on, you never were on a, tra- a traveling team. A tra- no, I played all those sports. I guess it wasn't good enough. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Taekwondo only stayed in Long Island, New York. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. So I'm 18 years old, and I'm a loyal listener to the podcast. I love weight training, but the people in my life have a problem with it, saying that I'm going to become too big. So my question might be a bit weird. How do I get my arms smaller? I have a tiny waist, but 13 inch arms. I know it's a genetic thing. My brother and I train together, and people are normally amazed at how easily we gain muscle. I don't have any other problems, and most of my body is quite lean. What can I do to lose weight in my arms before going back home? Before I go back home from university, love your podcast and listen every week here in South Africa. Enya Nell. So I believe she's a female. I'm gonna, you know, mm, hopefully yeah, I, I did like butcher it. that, but I believe it's a female. Um, so she wants to get her arms smaller. So she's another one who lifts weights, and everyone's telling her she's gonna become big. So. Yeah. How could she get her arms smaller? You want me to take it or you could want it? Well, the, the first thing I just want to throw out there is I, I'm not really sure if she actually wants to get her arms smaller or if she's only doing it because no, no. other people said that she should. No, but I, see, like, uh, oh, again, she's in South Africa, so it's different, yeah, okay. you know, different way they speak out there. She says, how do I get my arms smaller? So, and she's worried that people are going to say that she's going to yeah. become big from lifting weight. So when I think she's saying smaller... I believe that she's talking about body fat. That she wants to get her okay. body fat levels down to shrink her arms. She doesn't okay. want to look. She doesn't want big arms. So she thinks if she keeps working out, that she's right. going to get bigger arms. But I think she's trying to lose body fat in her arms. Right. Well, if that's, the, if that's she says yeah. she doesn't have a problem losing lean, uh, getting lean. She says she's quite lean, but she wants to lose specifically. In the, so she basically wants to target her arms okay. to lose body fat in that area. Okay. I mean, well, the one thing I want to add, if in case that that's not the the issue, and she's saying that she wants to lose muscle because other people don't like I it, don't and they say that's she what should. She wants because I mean, I don't because she says <laughs> you're not I letting trans- me say what I want to say. I know, but I'm just <laughs> saying because based okay. on what she's saying, I have the question in front of me. All right, leather pants. <laughs> okay, but the way I'm interpreting it is that she's saying maybe that somebody else told her she'll look better if she loses size to her arms. And I just want to throw out there if she does like building muscle and likes having muscular arms then she shouldn't not train her arms and she shouldn't purposely try to lose size just to please other people she should do what she likes but with that said we can answer her question if that's not the case so are you gonna answer so the i'll let you take are it you from gonna, here no, no, gonna, i'll let you give the tony robbins answer I'll let you're you, gonna give the easy tony robbins answer aren't you i'll let you take it <laughs> since you're so adamant about that all right, so basically it seems like, like I said, she wants to lose body fat in her arms specifically. So there's no no way in particular to lose uh, body fat in a certain area, unfortunately. You know, a lot of people want a six-pack and they can't get a six-pack and they'll do the crunches up to wazoo until they actually get a six-pack. But the, pro- the point is if your body fat levels are lower, that's when the six-pack is going to come out. So same thing with your arms. Maybe genetically um, – and women, I find this more, hold a little more body fat in their arms than men do – so I would say just focus on being in a caloric deficit, so, so be in a dieting phase. Because um, maybe you don't want to lose weight all over, but you do have to lose body fat in order to shrink your arms down. Again, I wouldn't worry about building your arms up because it's so hard to get um, big arms. Take it from me. Yeah. It's not an easy thing. It's not something that's going to happen. You know, I used to have clients tell me, oh, I get big arms doing the elliptical. And countless times I've said, maybe I should go on the elliptical if I want bigger mm-hmm. arms. But um, – I would say just focus on getting lean, focus on being in a caloric deficit. And if you're in a caloric deficit, you don't have to worry about getting big anywhere because that's not going to happen. 
And it's not easy to get big. You know, women are under this misconception that if they lift weights, they're going to get huge. They're going to look like a guy, and that's totally not the case. Yeah, especially in the upper body, too. I mean, women tend to put muscle on pretty easily in the legs. Uh, but the upper body, especially, it's it's not easy. It takes a lot of hard work. And you know, if your if your goal is to burn body fat, um, and you do tend to tend to store it in the in the upper body and in the arms, everybody has you know they they store body fat a little bit different. Um, that's usually not an issue for most women. It's usually more the legs and the lower body. But if it, in your case it is the upper body, um, the the biggest thing is you're, you're just gonna have to lose body fat overall. And generally, those places where you store that extra body fat, that's like the last place it'll come off. So um, you know, if you are losing body fat overall and you are seeing progress, but you're not seeing it where you want, you just need to lose more body fat overall because eventually your body will start pulling from those body parts with that uh, that stubborn fat. So that might be the last place for you that it comes off, but it will, as long as you're on the right track, it's going to take time. Exactly. And and if for whatever reason, maybe you do gain muscle rather easily and you seem that your arms seem to, uh, you know, add size a little easier than other areas, uh, maybe just scale back the volume. Don't do so much direct arm work. You know, don't maybe not, if you're, whatever, if anyone listening to this, if your biceps happen to, if you happen to be like Big Pete and your biceps grow from doing incline, bre- incline bench press, um, <laughs> True statement, maybe just, by the way. <laughs> just scale back on the rest of the volume, you know, just try, uh, try doing less, you know, you, you don't, there's not necessarily a recipe for success as far as like overall development. So if you're doing now five sets of biceps in a workout, maybe cut it down to, to three, you know, yeah. or even two, just put them on like a maintenance, lower the volume for them and focus on the areas that need to be brought up, such as maybe, uh, maybe your legs, maybe you want to bring up your legs and how your legs look. If you want more tonal legs and more shapely legs then maybe Add that extra volume to leg work and see see where you go from there. So I, I think we answered that question rather well. Yeah. You gave her the Tony Robbins answer, which I'm surprised that you gave her that kind of an answer. Yeah, well, you know, there's two, there's two, two things to take away from this. Either uh, if it's the body fat issue, um, you know, I think we applied the information for that one. And if it's a uh, personal issue, take the Tony Robbins advice. <laughs> one, of, one of two should help you out. So I hope we answered her question. Yeah, I think we did. Hi right, man, this is uh we gotta get Austin on here. I'm starving, so I'm gonna run and go eat some more leftovers quick before we hop on the phone with him. So we're gonna take a short commercial break here and uh we'll be right back with blood work for body composition and fitness. What's up, New York Muscle Radio listeners? It's your co-host, Big Pete Kacharian, and I'm glad you're all listening. Put down that tilapia and asparagus. Learn how to get bigger, stronger, and leaner eating what you want. Pick up a copy of Cracking the Flexible Diet Co. exclusively at NewYorkMuscleRadio.com. But for now, let's get to the show. Damn. Nice, Pete. What? I saw you checking out that girl's butt. What? I was just checking out her yoga pants. Pete. I was thinking you'd look really good in yoga pants. Uh-huh. I was like trying to check out what brand it was. Like I was looking at her form on deadlifts. They were all messed up. Do you think she has a nicer butt than me? Well, it definitely doesn't look like a pancake. Did you just call my butt a pancake? Well, I mean... What can I do? You gotta try New York Muscle Radio's Glutelicious program. Glutelicious? Yeah, you'll finally get a celebrity booty, like all the other girls following the program. Fine, I'll do it. But don't get jealous when other guys check out my Glutelicious ass. Glutelicious, your guide to getting a celebrity booty in 12 weeks. Now available exclusively at NewYorkMuscleRadio.com. Want anything special for your birthday? Just a decent cup of coffee. You're kidding. I'm serious. Honey, your coffee's undrinkable. That's pretty harsh. Well, so's your coffee. You know, the girls down at the office make better coffee on their hot plates. And he didn't even kiss me goodbye. You know, if I could just make a decent cup of coffee, I could relax. So, relax. Why don't you try Coffeine from BuyProteinCoffee.com. Tastes good as fresh perk. Good as fresh perk. And it has protein. 10 grams per scoop. I'll surprise Harvey for his birthday tonight. Hey, great coffee. Doesn't it taste good as fresh perk? Better. Better than those girls make at the office. Honey, their coffee can't hold a candle to yours. Coffee, the world's only instant coffee that's fortified with muscle-building protein. Visit BuyProteinCoffee.com now. 
Hey guys, it's your host, Anthony Bevilacqua, and I just wanted to announce that my brand new personal training facility is now open. I'm currently taking on new clients in the Long Island, New York area. If you're interested in working with the best personal trainer in the business, head on over to abfitnesstrainer.com and sign up for your free consultation. Then you can understand why bodybuilding.com has named me personal trainer of the month. All right, guys, we're back. New York Muscle Raider, episode number 138, blood work for body composition and fitness. So today we have an interesting topic. I'm super excited for this one. We have on one of our clients, Austin Austin Marshall, MPAS slash CPAAPA slash PAC. So basically he's a lot smarter than us. Austin's going to give us the rundown from a medical point of view on what to look for in your blood work. And we're actually going to do like a live case study using – Big Pete and myself are actual blood work. So, Austin, welcome to New York Muscle Radio. Give the listeners a little bit more information about you and your experience with fitness and the medical side of fitness. Hey, what's up, guys? I really appreciate y'all having me on. Uh, I'm really excited to talk with you guys. Uh, so, you know, I'm a, a PA, physician associate, uh, meaning, you know, I went to undergrad and then uh, to PA school. Uh, now I'm actually working on, it's kind of an optional thing, but a, a PhD in clinical nutrition. Uh, but I'm, you know, in uh, internal medicine, kind of primary care. So you know, I get to see pretty much a wide range of anything and everything that, you know, you quote, go to the doctor for. So, uh, you know, I like to look at myself just kind of as uh, a generalist that I, you know, have a, a little bit of information on a lot of different topics and really get the, the gratitude of being able to kind of see everything all together and get to look at the whole picture. Um, so, you know, when I graduated PA school, uh, I was, uh, six foot, 240 pounds. I was just a, a big old plump walking around. And, uh, you know, so as I was getting into medicine, I kind of found that a lot of essentially the, a lot of the way that traditional, you know, Western medicine kind of does things is very reactive in nature. It's not, uh, it's not like we are preventing a lot. We're just sort of putting band-aids on stuff and, you know, telling people to, you know, move on by and, and, you know, come back when, when you actually have an issue. And, and so, you know, a lot of that started getting me kind of thinking and researching if, if there was a better way to do it. And so, you know, that's when I just kind of started getting into fitness and uh, looking into, you know, bodybuilding, what's the actual, you know, what does the medical literature say about losing weight, and what to do as, as far as uh, diet and macros. And that's lo and behold, where I, uh, Got the, the pleasure of meeting you fine gentlemen on uh, New York Muscle Radio, and it's been, uh, you know, I've listened to every single podcast since, so, um, you know, that's, that's really kind of where I started back uh, about three years ago um, uh, into practice, and then kind of started on the, the PhD now for the past year or so, so just living life and doing all that, I'm, you know, not really uh, involved in much else besides just work and, and working out. See, I, I like this guy already because he already he already said the magic words. A lot of Western medicine now is putting a Band-Aid on things. And that seems to be the problem with just the medical industry in its own because, like, you can't even go to the doctor. If I went to the doctor for something, let's say my shoulder was bothering me. Oh, stop working out. That's not the answer that I want to hear because, one, yeah. I'm not going to stop yeah. working out. And, yeah. two, that's just that, like some doctors just don't know. So you're, like, well-rounded in that sense. And I'm, I'm excited to know that you're going for your Ph.D. in clinical nutrition. That's – that's uh definitely gives you a, a one leg up on the competition. Yeah, well, I mean, it's you know, it's really just interesting, you know, like when, when I got into it, it's like, well, I mean, you know, there's so many different quote experts on so many different things, and and it's just like, holy crap! I mean, wh wh where do you start to draw the line and say, okay, these people know what they're talking about versus these don't? And so that's you know, really kind of sparked an interest as far as like, okay, what's got actual like medical. Uh, you know, medical literature behind it and what doesn't and, you know, kind of take that and got to apply it to each and every person's situation. I mean, much like what you guys do, you know, I got the base of counting your macros and then you have to apply it to each different patient and in and, and their given context. So one of the things I'm going to ask you before we get started with this is um, going for becoming a doctor and a physician's assistant, how much nutrition knowledge do they have prior to going into that? Because one of the things that I hate about doctors is they give out weight horrible nutritional advice. <laughs> so what kind of a background do they have nutritionally? You know, obviously yours aside because you're an extra step, but in your normal doctor path, how much nutrition do they get? Because everyone <laughs> takes the doc a doctor told me not to eat carbs. So that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. I mean, having that white coat is a luxury that we take for granted. I mean, big time, but you know, it, honestly, it's, 
it's pretty laughable how much actual like fitness and nutrition knowledge that most Western medicine people have. I mean, not to, to dog on our profession. Obviously, we you know, we go through a lot of hell to, to get to the oh, no, point no, no, that no, we no. are. Yes, but rightfully so. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, it's it's uh, like pr- essentially, I mean, quite honestly, it was probably about a two hour lecture. Uh, and, and it was, you know, just a flyby topic, you know, just just tack it on to everything else, whether you remembered it or not. You know, that, that was, you know, registered dietitian came in and kind of gave us some of the the basic breakdown. So, yeah, I mean, most Western medicine, medical schools, PA schools, everything is is really pretty lacking in, in that. And that's probably something that needs to be changed. But, you know, there's just it's not a big push, really. Definitely. All right, we have a listener question today. We're actually going to have you answer our listener question today because I think this is all fitting. Lately, all the podcasts, all the topics just seem to be flowing into each other. So we're going to answer this question together, but Austin, you're going to kind of lead the way here. So right. again, if you guys have a listener question you want us to answer, you could submit it on our website, newyorkmuscleradio.com slash listener question. So today's question, everybody keeps telling me to stop lifting heavy because it will affect my quote unquote insides and have trouble getting pregnant down the road. I know this is false but I want some hard evidence to throw back at these people. I'm a female age 26 and healthy. Thank you in advance. Keep up the good work. Danielle K. So basically nice. I think that, uh, she's working out hard and, uh, people are telling her, don't do that. Don't lift heavy. Cause you're not gonna be able to get pregnant down the line. Well, so, you know, I mean, that's first of all, so, so freaking common to, to hear, you know, someone saying that to, uh, someone else. And a lot of times it's kind of funny. You got to look at the person giving the advice. A lot of times, you know, their BMI might be closer to 30 and they might be enjoying, you know, a few too many desserts. And, sure. you know, it, it, a lot of times, uh, it, pretty much the context of anything medical is always, well, it depends. And, you know, it, I find that, that people who give a lot of absolutes, we got to be careful taking advice from them because there's so many different factors. But so for, for this lady at, uh, what was her age again? 26. 26. Okay. So, so she's, she's powerlifting and the advice is, oh, you ought not to work out because, uh, you might not become, you, you might have issues with her insides and not become pregnant. So the reason that that's problematic to, to just give that blanket statement is, is it's kind of referring to the one part of females working out that you guys have touched on quite a bit is, you know, just an ovulation based upon, you know, essentially a, a combination of caloric restriction as well as, you know, overexertion and, uh, and too much physical activity. So, you know, that's, that's essentially the main thing. And there's one commonality that, you know, the, whoever's getting invited that this lady, whoever, um, whoever she is, that it, it needs to be essentially, you just have to look at your menstrual cycle. And if there's a menstrual cycle on board, that means that she has ovulated and there is no issues at that point as from an ovulation standpoint to get pregnant, which is the main thing that we base our, our recommendation around, you know, you might, you might become infertile and that's the main re- the main thing. There's nothing else around, uh, her lifting weight. So she should, if, if anything, keep doing exactly what she's doing. There's, you know, copious evidence to support that. Solid advice, man. See, we're, Austin's from Texas, so you know he gives it straight, straight out of the cow's mouth, right? <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah, just eat steaks, and and I ride to the clinic on my horse every day. <laughs> <laughs> Pete, I forgot you were on here, man. I was having a conversation with Austin. Yeah, What's going I'm, on, man? I'm, I'm soaking up all this information already. And I'm like I said earlier before we started the podcast, I have so many questions that I want to ask him that, yes, it's definitely um, from my own personal information, but I think it's really good stuff that uh, a lot of people listening to this want to hear. Yeah. All right, let's get right into this. So, Austin, how, is it, how important is it for, to get regular blood work done for fitness athletes, bodybuilders, and anyone who wants to improve their body composition as well as overall health? Well, so, you know, we as, you know, a medical community in, in a lot of ways are taught to put you know, a lot of stock into into lab work. But you know, one of the, the, the main things throughout this entire conversation is is that it's so important to remember that we're getting a snapshot in a, a direct second of time that that person is getting their labs actually drawn. You know, the human body is so freaking complex and it's it's just there's so many different biochemical factors that are going on. Uh, and, and labs are essentially a it's it's essentially just kind of a a way to to track a lot of the processes that are going on in the human body, but it's not a perfect thing. I mean, there's so many different things that that can influence uh, what labs look like. Uh, you know, in in general, I mean, it 
you hate to always kind of give this, but it, well, it depends and it depends on, on the person and the patient. So first and foremost, the, the most important thing is, you know, what, what is your family history? Do you have any genetic predispositions as far as, you know, family members with different types of conditions or diseases that you need to be on top of and, and look out for like, you know, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, uh, kidney disease of some sort, diabetes, you know, hyperlipidemia, cholesterol. So, you know, a, a lot of that, you know, at first to say, well, it depends, you know, who, who are your parents? Uh, but, you know, in general, has a very broad general statement. We say, you know, everyone really on average wants to get lab work about every two to three years, you know, and when you're in our kind of demographic as far as, you know, otherwise healthy 20 to 40 year old people, uh, you know, every two or three years is is pretty standard, and that's not even agreed upon in the medical community. You know, we, we have some guidelines that say, oh, well, if there's nothing else going on and they're healthy otherwise, don't wait till they're 40 to start getting lab work. And I, you know, I usually start at around, you know, 20 or so, just uh, at least to establish a baseline. And that's important. You know, you want to see, kind of track it over the years when you're otherwise young and healthy. You just want to get a baseline as far as you know, kidney function, liver function, blood counts, thyroid function, you know, a lot of stuff like that. So, I mean, in a lot of ways, it's like bringing your car in uh, to the mechanic and there's not necessarily any major issues, but if they can tell you, well, your, your alignment's a little bit out now, then you can kind of fix that before it starts to become a, a big issue later on. So, Pete, I'm jumping off the course already. So, <laughs> he mentioned something already that I want to touch upon. So now, Go, going back to family history. Now, one of the things I was always concerned with, and um, this will tie into everything that we're saying, um, my dad has diabetes. So this is one thing that I was always concerned with as far as like t um, carbs, you know, just overall in general. I seem to tolerate carbs really well, and um, I have a very fast metabolism, so I need the carbs to actually keep weight on and whatnot. So my whole fear of that was always because my dad has diabetes. Should I be watching that? Should my um, carb intake not be so high? Um I know I'm a lot younger. My dad got diabetes when he was a kid. He had, uh, you know, juvenile diabetes, and that's how it started. So I was always just a kind of a concern of mine. So if somebody listening to this who is in the same boat as me, um, what should they do as far as carbs? What should they look for um, as far as blood work goes also? Yeah, yeah. That's, I mean, that's a really good question because – a lot of times, I mean, think about how common diabetes is. We hear about it all the time, and it's, it's a, a huge issue in, in the primary care realm as far as, you know, stuff that we can treat and, and get under control and hopefully prevent, you know, the long-term consequences of diabetes, which, you know, it's essentially when you're talking about, you know, something like diabetes, the main things that, that you're looking at down the road is, you know, damage to a lot of your big vessels and small vessels. So uh, that can happen uh, in, you know, like in your kidneys, in your uh, blood vessels in, in your eyes. I mean, it happens like a lot of different places, but, you know, one of the most important things that we're talking about when we're talking about a family history is you got to know, you know, type one versus type two. So uh, a lot of times uh, type two is much, much more common, you know, in general in the, the Western world. Uh, but type one is, is more of an autoimmune condition where they'd have an absolute lack of insulin. So, I mean, in your case in particular, the uh, you know, you saying that dad had uh, type 1 diabetes, if you haven't gotten it at this point in your life, nothing is guaranteed, but there's pretty much 0% likelihood that you're going to develop type 1 diabetes at this point in your life. Uh, you know, your, your pancreas has been around long enough that if it was going to have an autoimmune degradation of it, it would have already happened by now, uh, traditionally, you know, based on the textbook. But, uh, you know, type 2 diabetes is definitely... Uh, you know, we see it run a lot in, in families and, and we can see, you know, essentially a, a trend in families. And, you know, there's so many confounding factors there. You know, you, you go to their Thanksgiving table and, and you look at it and, you know, it, it would be, you know, completely you different. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so and now uh, one more side note question, because I asked my doctor this. So now they, I've heard this down the grapevine that diabetes kind of skips a generation. So my daughter now, my daughter, she, she eats well, but she's very, very active. So she likes her sweets also. So this is something that I yell at my wife constantly for. Yeah. But they say that diabetes skips a generation. So I kind of asked my doctor, hurt my, my daughter's doctor this, yeah. you know, should we, is this something that we should be concerned with? Because obviously I'm concerned for my daughter and I want the well-being sure. from her. So is that true that diabetes kind of skips a generation? And should I be watching those kind of things for her as well? Well, so, you know, what, what they're probably talking about when people say that, uh, first of all, it's like such a huge kind of overgeneralization. But, you know, if, if, 
it were to quote skip a generation, what they're talking about is is essentially is your genetics. So you know you might not have inherited said gene that kind of turns on the switch to type one diabetes, but the the thought is is okay. Well, maybe uh, it can skip a generation and you still have that gene in your genome and you pass it along to uh, to your daughter, even though that you're not an active carrier to it. So you know it's 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 essentially it's it's kind of like just rolling the dice. It's it's a it's a happenstance kind of thing. So mm. you know it's it is not at all a guaranteed sort of thing that uh, she would be. Uh, you know, is she predisposed? Maybe, possibly, but uh, you know, it's it's. I would I would say so much more percent chance that that you're not going to be dealing with that versus you 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 are going to be dealing with that. Because how old is she? Three. Three. Yeah. No, I mean, it, all you can do is, I mean, you can't change your genetics. You can't pick your parents, but, um, you know, it's, it's you just got to kind of monitor her. And, I mean, you know, minimizing, you know, high sugar stuff in, in kids is probably good advice, you know, regardless of any predisposition. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So now going back to, now relating this all back to blood work. So when you go to the doctor, what blood test should you ask for and what should you kind of get checked? Because I know with my glucose, I always check my fasting glucose levels because that's obviously a good indicator if you could handle carbohydrates or not. Right, right. So, you know, the the glucose is something that uh, we freak the hell out on <laughs> for, you know, so, there's so many different things that can uh, cause it to go up and down. And for, for instance, I mean, I just got some blood work, you know, last week. And, you know, after dropping, you know, about 50, 60 pounds over the past few months, my glucose was, you know, up just a little bit. And, you know, so we have a uh, a more accurate test, which I'll talk about later, is called the A1C. We have that, you know, in the clinic that we can get a point of care. So I just went over to our machine and got it, and you know, lo and behold, yeah, you're not even close to even being pre-diabetic. You know, the A1C was at 5.1 or uh, something like that. So it, you know, it it is a snapshot in time. Uh, so many different things obviously go into it, but you know, we use it as a screening tool. So you know, when you're looking at like what are just when I'm getting annual blood work, what what exactly are you getting? So uh, it, in general, if you want more blood tests, you're going to have to ask your doctor for them. So, uh, in general, most of us are getting a CBC, which is your blood counts, uh, a BMP, which is a, a basic metabolic panel. That's all your electrolytes and your kidney function. Uh, some of us are getting hepatic function panels, which is just kind of a general overshot of, uh, how, how all of your, your liver enzymes and, uh, you know, a few extra separate ones in there. Um, and then, you know, TSH is commonly ordered, which is thyroid uh, stimulating hormone. That's a kind of like a screening test for any thyroid abnormalities. And then one that we, we focus on as well is, is lip, uh, lipids. So, you know, just kind of a baseline as far as what your cholesterol and your triglycerides are. And that's, you know, a fairly standard annual blood work. And so if you want all the special stuff that we'll talk about later is, I mean, it's, it's definitely something that you're going to have to ask for. Uh, and then you'll usually get someone that's raising an eyebrow at you and saying, well, why do you want that? And, um, you know, but it, 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 if, if you're looking at just a general overall picture of health, those are kind of the main baseline and labs that we usually order. Do you think those tests should be part of the annual tests as well? Those extra tests? Well, you know, it, when I first got into medicine, uh, you know, I went, I went balls to the wall on a lot of stuff and, you know, yeah, I'm going to, you know, get their, uh, their FSH and LH and, you know, this and this and all these like, you know, high dollar expensive labs and kind of gradually got to see like, well, even if I get some of these back that are maybe slightly abnormal, what am I going to do with anything that's different? So, you know, a lot of times you just have to balance uh, cost of them because some of them are, you know, like a testosterone. That, that puppy's like $500 to, to send out. And, uh, you know, a lot of labs don't do it. They send it to somewhere special and, it you know, it's, it's expensive. And, uh, you know, so it, you just kind of have to weigh it with the patient's preference and, you know, what, what you're going to do with it if you get any kind of abnormal labs. Yeah, my doctors don't like it when I ask for those. <laughs> I get a lot of those eyebrows that you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I love it. If, if someone comes in and they're, you know, want to break down and get into all the science with it, I, I love that. I mean, it, it's involved patient. So what are some of the common things that might show up in lab work of a bodybuilder that some doctors might kind of misinterpret? So I guess creatine, AST, liver elevations, um, fasting blood sugar spikes, blood abnormal counts. Yeah, so, you know, I would say uh, because, you know, going back to our training, we, we don't have, you know, a, a huge baseline as far as, 
you know, nutrients and, and uh, you know, nutrition and, and weightlifting and, you know, its physiologic effects on the body, you know, a lot of it is we're still looking at you just like your our other, you know, 40 year old, you know, uh, person that, that is, is fat and sits, you know, at a desk job all day. So, you know, you can't, it's two completely different patients. You know, like I said, everything depends on just the, the slew of your body. So, uh, you know, for most important things that we, you might get stuff back from your doctor in the fitness community, uh, probably creatine is, is, especially bodybuilders is, is going to be one of the, the biggest things that, you know, creatine is, is a breakdown product, uh, of creatine in the body that, you know, if you see it on your lab work, it might be called creatinine. And that's just the same thing. It's just kind of the, the body's process of turning it into uh, creatine to, to creatinine. And, and so the whole reason that we look at it in the first place is, is that our kidneys are really good at just excreting it at a nice and steady rate. So it keeps it nice and steady. Uh, and so we, we, watch it as, as a marker of kidney function because the kidneys are, are good at filtering it at just the right amount. Uh, but the issue is, is that, you know, there's, there's things upstream that can cause it to, to go up. And so in, in our case of, of lifting weights and uh, eating protein, that, that, that's kind of the, the biggest thing in, in athletes that a lot of times is slightly elevated. And it's, it's because, you know, major, like three different things. So, you know, you have constant muscle breakdown for through lifting weights etc uh you got you know a lot of folks are, are supplementing with uh creatinine or creatine over the counter uh, and then just you know having a higher protein content is is going to show up as far as in, in the lab work so you know that's that's creatine um so I, you know i actually have my levels in front of me right now and the last test the range seems to be uh, milligrams per deciliter and it's 0.4 to 1.4 and mine was a 1.27 Right, Just exactly. Give you guys, an idea how it's closer to the high end. Pete, what was mine, yours? Mine is actually almost identical. I'm one. I'm actually. Uh, well, you said one point two. Yeah, one point two seven. I'm actually one point oh two, so I'm a little bit lower. Yeah, well, so you know, I'm bigger the, than you, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, the most important thing when you're looking at uh, that creatinine is is just kind of one piece of the puzzle. We use it with you know your age and and your ethnicity. Uh, it goes into this big formula and it calculates what's called the GFR. So the GFR is the thing that that we look at that really is is a whole lot more important uh, in, in regards to kidney function and that sort of thing. So you know if yeah, you so have it says um, I'll read mine that's to have it in front of me. GFR calculations. It says um, and then it has GFR in African American as you said. Also, it should be uh, above fifty nine and mine was seventy six. Right, right, and and, Pete, and even. I don't know if Pete. I have mine on here, so it's. Um, I'm just looking at Dude, mine. Dude, where do you get like, blood work done? That's, the that's, corner store. <laughs> I'm curious. I mean, I actually sent this blood work over to Austin earlier, so he can probably tell me. Did it look like I got sufficient blood work done the this time <laughs> this time around? Let's see. So in 2016, I got it in front of me. Uh, Big Pete's was his creatinine was 1.02, so his GFR, uh, his was at 101, so his GFR. Uh, and that was what I was going to say is, is, you know, it on, on paper, Anthony's, it might look like, oh, well, you, you might have a little bit of mild kidney disease. And, you know, the truth of the matter is, no, you don't, you, you just, you know, lift like a, a weightlifter and, and you, you eat, you know, the, the macros that you eat and, you know, it just shows up. It's just a formula. So, you know, we can't put way too much stock in it. So, you know, in the setting of the, the whole overall picture, that's completely normal. You know, Big Peach just happened to be just a slight bit uh, higher, and, and it all goes into that, that ratio. You know, his BUN was also a little bit uh, lower as well. So there's so many different things that, that go into it. But like I said, snapshot in time. Yeah. So what else? We were, we were down the road, and we just kind of cut you off as we were reading the blood work here. Okay. Well, so, you know, some of the, the other things that we'll see a whole lot is uh, – well, I wouldn't say a whole lot, but – you know, a lot of time, liver enzymes. And, uh, you know, you, you have to look at the, you know, these in general, there's there's two main ones that we look at and what's called AST and ALT. Uh, and, and these are two type of what's called transaminases, which is just kind of like a, a type of enzyme that's involved with uh, amino acid metabolism. So it's just kind of one of the things that goes into the big slew of the human body of as far as uh, an, an enzyme that helps things to work a little bit better. So, uh, one of the things that, you know, the whole reason we, we monitor these in, quote, average patients is just it's it's a good marker for, 
you know, how, how much damage or, or degradation there is to the liver, which is useful in, uh, you know, medical issues like, like hepatitis and, you know, trauma to the liver and, and that sort of thing. Uh, but, you know, it, it's on that standard lab panel. So, you know, a lot of times with bodybuilders, uh, and this is mainly, you know, definitely resistance training folks, uh, the aerobic uh, treadmill bunnies probably aren't going to have too much issue with the, the ALT, AST, but, uh, you know, a lot of times you'll see these uh, just kind of slightly elevated uh, and, and more likely than not, I would say most of them probably are coming straight from the gym. Uh, and a lot of times that's what, you know, we'll, we'll work out in the morning and then go get our labs drawn after that, still fasting. And that's kind of one of the, the natural parts of uh, amino acid metabolism and, and moving nutrients around your body after you work out. So that's one that, that you know, we'll see quite a bit that's, that's just essentially just kind of mildly elevated. But, you know, you, you definitely got to, you know, make sure and trend it and make sure that, okay, you don't have any sort of, uh, you know, uh, fatty liver, or you don't have, uh, you know, other things that, that commonly cause a slight elevation is a lot of uh, alcohol or over-the-counter stuff like Tylenol products, some herbal stuff can can cause it to be a little bit high too. I mean, Wait. in addition, in so, addition so, to, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to say, in addition to anything prescription-based, I mean, there's you know a handful of prescription meds that that can be related with these liver enzymes bumping up. So now, basically, based on what you said, if you if you're so if you're more active and you do more cardio, these liver enzymes aren't as high as if you're not, correct? Well, so it like more, just, if you do more cardio, I guess more more just in general activity versus just lifting weights. Yeah, that, that's essentially what the research is, has, to the best of my knowledge, is, has kind of come up with is it's more of a function of uh, resistance training and, you know, strong loads that cause this slight increase in AST, ALT, not necessarily like a steady state cardio. So this is funny because I just kind of want to I want to touch upon this. So Pete came back with your liver enzymes were a little elevated. So now mine are normal. So they're in the normal range. They never came back elevated. So it's, I just wanted to touch upon, I think it has to do with lifestyle also. I'm a lot more active than Pete. Um, definitely up on my feet a lot more. I don't sit down between sets. And Pete's like, he'll lift and he'll lie down on the floor. <laughs> so I, I, I wonder because my, my knee, which is my uh, non-resting activity level for those who don't know what knee is, um, my knee is a lot higher than his. So I wonder if that's why my liver enzymes aren't as elevated as he, his are. Because he's definitely... According to the neat scale, he's you know he's a couch potato. I didn't realize that about Big Pete. I thought, yeah, I thought yeah, he was yeah. this. <laughs> no, he's I definitely he's, more active sleep. than me. Um, yeah, he'll, Pete will sleep on the floor in between sets if he could. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, it, like I said, it depends. I mean, it that that might be one factor that goes into it. Um, you know, Big Pete, do you drink a lot of alcohol? No, I actually don't. And and you know that was <laughs> no. The funny thing was that was the first thing my doctor asked me when. Uh, my my recent blood work came back, and I think specifically it was my ALT was a lot higher. Uh, my yeah. AST was slightly elevated, but AST seemed to be pretty high compared to the normal range. And that was the first thing. And they said, if you're not doing that, then the only thing I could tell you is clean up your diet a little bit. You know, and that, that, <laughs> that was not the answer I wanted to hear, but that's that was the that was the extent of the advice I had gotten. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, which is which is terrible advice. Well, I mean, it was probably the faux hawk and leather pants that he, he just <laughs> probably party. had something to do with it. <laughs> the leather pants. Everybody, he wore them again the other day. I'm like, I was telling everybody about those leather pants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, honestly, it's 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 all related to you working out and just stimulating your muscles. So if you get if if you work out hard enough, that I think that would if 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 in your case, I say, yeah, you're you're working out hard enough. That that's a good thing. And given once you've ruled out all the other bad stuff. All right, so there's right. proof in my blood work that my training is effective. <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Or you're lazy, one or the other. <laughs> All right, so for hormones and testosterone in Pacific, specific, because I know this, this is what's going to come up, uh, there's always a reference range that's considered normal and healthy, but obviously having testosterone on the higher end of the normal would help males prefer uh, get bigger, bigger muscles, you know, burn more fat. What steps could someone take to kind of improve testosterone within the normal range, and how much of that is strictly genetic? And I guess kind of like what supplements can someone use uh, to kind of increase that? Because I know mine, I mean, compared to freaking Pete's, Pete's testosterone levels are like, what were they the last time you checked them, Pete? I believe they were 778 was the number. And so my recent blood work, my testosterone came back at 420. So basically the range is, where's my paper? 
The range is uh, 249 to 836. So I'm like, I guess, dead smack in the middle there. So basically, I'm a woman, and uh, Pete's double the man that I am, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> so how do I not let that happen? Well, you know, uh, first of all, the testosterone in particular, we got, you know, free and total testosterone. And most of the time when we're going through the, you know, the process of ordering it, most folks are, you know, getting both of them free and total. Uh, and, and it's good because, it, you know, in order for testosterone to have an effect on the body, it has to be bound to protein. There's different types of protein that it binds to. Uh, but it's such another transient thing, uh, you know, and, and it's a pretty expensive test, too, to actually ship off and, uh, you know, to, to actually get done. So, you know, a lot of times we're not, you know, monitoring it on a, on a regular basis like you could with like a blood sugar or something. So, you know, we're getting that one snapshot in time, you know, every few months or year or whatever. And, you know, that, that reference range is massive. It, and, and honestly, the, the biggest thing is that, you know, most people are really, I mean, on the other side of this, most people are coming back right about where Anthony's coming back, even a little bit lower. I mean, honestly, you know, kind of typical male is in, in our age range is about, you know, anywhere between 300, 350 or so to about 500. That's, I would say, a, a whole lot more normal than what big pete's getting and you know the biggest thing is is genetics you got to you know pick your parents wisely so to speak and and that's that's one of the biggest factors as far as how much test that you have on board and that's you know probably one of the biggest things when we say you know well that that guy's just you know bigger because of his genetics that's probably a lot uh, you know as far as what's actually the science behind it is is you know fluctuations in testosterone and you know it's muscle building effects uh but you know as far as what can we do to, to actually increase it? Ah, it's, it's a rabbit hole that I feel like you guys have probably answered better than I could. But, you know, th there's really not all that much besides getting good sleep and, you know, working hard, eating appropriate amounts of, you know, macronutrients. One of the bigger things with, uh, with testosterone, some of the research is showing, you know, a little bit higher in uh, healthy fat content uh, can actually help boost it up a tad bit. But it's not like, you know, it's not like you're taking – testosterone cypionate 8 going to boost it up like you know 400 you know, nanograms per deciliter it's it's you know like maybe 40 50 per, uh you know 40 50 points versus you know what you would if you were uh you know endogenously or exogenously uh, supplementing yeah yeah so okay so based on that you need your free and your your test so basically from what i know your free is kind of what's actually used by the body so pete what was your free level on that test do you have it in front of you or no I believe it. I, Austin could actually correct me if I'm wrong here, but when I looked at the, the labs that I had gotten done, it looked like they only measured my total, but not my free. Did you happen to see free on there? And is that normal that they would do just total? Uh, <laughs> yeah, Pete's corner store doctor. <laughs> well, you know, it was funny when I had actually asked for those tests to be taken again, it was an issue. Like, why do you want to take this? You know, uh, you know, I, I got the eyebrow raise and um, this last lab that I had gotten done with the testosterone on it was actually after a contest prep and I wanted to make sure my levels were normal because I still had felt that you know that co that post contest fatigue everything just you know I wasn't feeling great and I uh, just wanted to get lab work done and that was the one thing that the doctor kind of raised the eyebrow about well, you know are you taking are you taking steroids why do you want to get your lab work done you know and I just wanted to make sure I was healthy and when I got yeah. back um, you know, again, testosterone was the one that I had to kind of convince him to put on there. When I had gotten it back, it was just total. So I, I don't think that free is actually even on there. Yeah, no, I'm looking at it right now, what you sent me. It, it didn't, uh, it just had the total. So <laughs> I think he was just writing off the faux hawk, man. But, you know, it, <laughs> you, so, uh, you know, you, you were at 774 as far as your total. So, you know, it's like it, it gives one snapshot, one, you know, kind of, aspect of the picture it sure would be nice though you know in order to get like a complete you know profile of it you would need the free and you know technically if you want to get real sciency and and wire glasses behind it you know you would want to get stuff like the lh and fsh and you know a lot of the other factors that go into well why does that number look the way that it does so you know in, in your case 774 is pretty stinking good especially how many weeks were you out at that point this was actually three months right after a contest but I actually didn't feel like uh, I actually went to the doctor because I said you know what I have to get some blood work done because I still didn't feel recovered from it so yeah. my at that time I was actually expecting testosterone to come back low you know I was I just wanted to see some blood work so when I got it back it made me even more confused I said you know what you know, I thought maybe I was suffering from low testosterone due to the contest prep and the diet uh, but testosterone 
clearly came back normal. So it, it confused me even more at that point. Yeah, yeah, no, it definitely wasn't, at least from the total, it, that wouldn't have been a factor there. So I actually, you know what, you, so you, you mentioned something too, and I don't have this blood work in front of me, but I did follow the one that I sent you. I followed it up a few months later um, just to check it again, and I, it must have been on that blood work because I don't have it on this one, but I had actually my, my FSH on there. I don't think okay. free, free was on there, but the odd thing about it was the testosterone came back almost exactly the same it might have been you know instead of 774 it might have been seven something um, like you said that could fluctuate but i did notice everything else looked fine but the fsh was actually low and that kind of threw me off because i said how is total testosterone high and fsh low and i don't know if that's normal huh. or odd yeah that i mean that is kind of a little bit interesting i mean the first well, thing he's that... an interesting guy man you don't even know the half of it <laughs> I know we only get snapshots in time of you know what what uh, Big Pete's like in his personal life. <laughs> There's not just look at the wall next to you, man. You see the wall? That's kind of what it's like. <laughs> but you know, with that FSH being low, first it, it, do you, you don't know you don't know exactly how low it was. Um, I don't remember the reference. Do you know what a re the offhand like what the reference range might be? It's very it's very small, right? The amount for FSH. Yeah, uh, it depends. You know, it, it also depends on the region of the world and the lab that they're actually mm -hmm. ordering it. So I don't even. I don't, even I, I don't have it in part. front of me. I believe. I, I mean, it was. That. Yeah, it was. I wish I had it in front of me. I could probably find it, but I don't. I don't have it for right now. But um, it was definitely low. Um, the doctor didn't even mention anything. You know, when he went over the labs with me, and uh, I had gotten this done. Like I said, I initially went to him telling him I wasn't feeling great because I still was. I felt the effects of contest prep, so I said, I really feel like maybe my testosterone is low. When he had handed it back to me, the only thing he said was, testosterone is fine. The only thing I would say is cortisol is high. That was, you know, then, then I took the blood work myself and looked at it, and I said, well, you know what, FSH is low, um, so that's a little bit odd, but I, I didn't have the doctor in front of me to actually ask him that, so... That was one thing, you know, again, like a couple months later, I felt I was fully recovered and I, I felt fine. So I didn't really stress it too much. But just looking back at it now, I'm interested in the correlation between that. Yeah, you know, honestly, I bet you had enough testosterone on board that essentially at that given point in time, you know, that reference range, I looked it up it as one, it's 1. 1.5 to 12.4. You know, it's got units with it, but uh, it's in that range. And so a lot of times if it shows up normal, it, you know, might be, you know, 1.3, 1.4, like right on that edge. And I bet, you know, I bet a lot of times, uh, that's probably what, what we're seeing there is essentially that your testosterone was, was high enough that, cause that FSH is produced by your brain. And it's essentially the hormone that tells your testes wake up and, and, you know, squirt out some more testosterone. And, uh, in your case scenario, I bet it's just kind of, like I said, a snapshot in time of, of it mm -hmm. being a little bit low because you had enough testosterone on board at that given point in time. So that would be another one to, that it would be interesting to, to trend it and see, okay, well, what is it, you know, a week later, two weeks later even. Uh, I mean, it's, it's all kind of purely academic at that point because, you know, it doesn't really matter. He's, you know, he, he's, he knows that you're, you're healthy otherwise. But, you know, it's just something interesting for, you know, the people who actually care about it and want to be at, you know, their peak performance and, you know, correlate in the labs as far as how they're feeling. I I love it when, when people are, are into that. Uh, you know, I'm right there with them. Yeah, so one thing I want, to touch on, well, I want to touch on too is going back to the whole testosterone thing was, and we talked about this a little bit before, so it's going to be kind of a repeat for us, but I think the listeners will enjoy hearing it. I checked my blood work in 07 because I still had that paperwork, and uh, my testosterone levels was 487 back in 07. So 10 years ago was 487. Today is 420. And my free testosterone was 16.6, and as of as of this year, it's now 8.5. My free, so basically, my free got kind of quote unquote cut in half. So, what do you think about that? I mean, we spoke about this already, but I just for the listeners, so they get an idea if that if they happen to compare old blood work to now, what they would see. Yeah, so you know, with like we we're saying earlier, it's it's the, in order for the testosterone to have an effect on its given tissues you know it's just a hormone and it's essentially it's it has all of its anabolic effects by essentially being transported and that usually is through what's called sex binding globulin hormone and albumin different you know types of protein that just kind of move it around in your blood and have its effect on the on the given tissues so you know that essentially is is kind of like uh, cabs in New York City. Give you guys a, a shout out there. So uh, you know it's it's essentially the 
the protein is is the passenger or sorry the protein is is like the the cabs driving around and the testosterone is the passengers you know needing to to get to different places and so at any given time you know 2 a.m. versus 5 p.m., there's going to be a different amount of protein that's available. And so if there's not enough protein to, uh, you know, shuttle things around, that the free might be a little bit different. So, you know, if, if, if there was a gun held to your head and you said, okay, you can only choose what one lab to draw and you had total or free, yeah, most people would probably just be more interested in the total. But, you know, it, it, it kind of gives a, a more accurate overall uh, picture of, of what's going on in, in the labs at, at that point as far as how much protein is around to help to transport the, the testosterone to have its effect on all the tissues. So uh, 10 years of aging, mine seem to be have gotten cut in half. So is this something I should like be concerned about? I mean, because from the, from the muscle building community, I mean, you know, on paper, I'm like, you know, I'm seeing this. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm becoming a woman. <laughs> uh, it might be all the soy. I think that's what. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See, man, I've been making my case, and here he's proven it. <laughs> uh, you know, in in your case in particular, there'd be a few things that I kind of first come to my mind. Uh, you and me sleep very similar, which is probably not enough. I mean, it sounds like you get about anywhere between five and seven hours a night or so. Is that yeah? That's about accurate? right. Maybe even less sometimes. And and I mean, you just you work like a son of a bitch. So I mean, like it it. Essentially, I think it's just I, I would kind of chalk it up, uh, you know, just kind of a general part of aging and having a kid and a wife and, and working like you do and, and the lifestyle that you do. I mean, a lot of times there's you know a lot of things that go into that, and if you're not giving your body quite enough time to rest and recover, uh, those numbers might degrade just a little bit uh, or look a little bit smaller. But you know, it's it's one point. Uh, and it would be interesting, you know, to, to be scientific with it. You want to get a repeat lab, you know, the next month and, and kind of compare it and see what changed. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Pete, you got anything else on testosterone so we can move on? No, I think that covers up testosterone pretty good for now. Yeah, we got, got a lot of other stuff that uh, <laughs> I'm curious about, so we can move on. All right, so perfect because this is kind of tie in. So, what exactly is cholesterol, and why do we care about it? And why is my, why might my lipid panel be better than Big Pete's despite eating exactly the same macros? Well, we know uh, Pete's lazy, so that's probably why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now, now that you've established that. Uh, well, so you know, cholesterol is bastardized for so many different reasons, but you know, mainly you, we got to take into context. Why, why do we even care about cholesterol? It's, it's, it's physiologic, meaning our body needs it to, uh, to survive. So if you look at, if you would get uh, a lipid panel on a brand new newborn baby, uh, if you would get, you know, their cholesterol just for fun, you, well, I don't know why you would, but it usually they're I, born, I have my daughters. Yeah. I, mean, I don't it, have it in front of me. I definitely know, but I'm sure I have it somewhere. If, if they got a lipid panel on her at, <laughs> I mean, it'd be funny more than anything, but uh, it, it's essentially the, you know, it has its effect on, it, it serves a few different functions as, as far as it, it helps to give our membranes a little bit of support, you know, all of our cell membranes, uh, helps with nerve conduction, helps with, you know, muscle tissue and, and all of the, the membranes on it. So, you know, we need it to live. And that number, if you look at, you know, general babies is anywhere between 30 or so, uh, uh, milligrams per deciliter of, of LDL cholesterol, which is the one that we really, you know, monitor a whole lot. Uh, if you look at that, it pretty standard is you need at least about 30 to 50, uh, just to, to survive and sustain. So, you know, whenever you get much higher than that is, is where we start to run into issues. Uh, and, and it's, so it's, just wait, before we continue, the LDL is the bad cholesterol, right? Yeah. So, okay. When, when you're getting a, a lipid panel, you got total cholesterol, which is all of it. And then you have, uh, HDL, which is your good cholesterol. Uh, and then you have LDL, which is your bad, uh, cholesterol. And then triglycerides are usually another portion of that. So, uh, it essentially the, you know, the LDL is bad because your body has, uh, essentially a, a defense mechanism. Whenever the insides of your vessels get damaged or inflamed or irritated in any way, your body responds by essentially just kind of laying down a nice layer of 
uh, stuff that'll help to to essentially soothe the inside of the the vessel. So and that in a lot of cases is you know calcium and uh, cholesterol, lipids, and uh, so the issue with doing that is if you do that you know over many many decades and you do stuff that pisses off the inside of your vessels, like you smoke and you're you know 40 pounds overweight and you you know li- live a high stress life and you don't get much exercise, that endovascular meaning inside of the vessels, the damage on the inside just continues to compound and continues to compound. So your body keeps on laying down what it knows to lay down, which is a lot of times the cholesterol to help to soothe that irritated vessel. And lo and behold, after, you know, a few years, decades, you know, usually into the fifth, sixth decade of life, that gets to be, you know, too much of an issue where blood can't get past it. And that's where we end up with the whole, you know, issue of uh, heart attacks and strokes, which, you know, is, is essentially the biggest killer at this point. So you know, that's why we care about it, especially when you're younger, because that's the time to actually prevent it and do something about it and change it. Um, and, and, you know, that if we can prevent it, it's a whole lot easier than having to, you know, crack someone's chest open and, you know, do a, a bypass or anything like that. Yeah. So, Pete, you have your blood work in front of you? Yes. I'm just curious. So just so everyone we have it. The reason why we're doing kind of uh, case studies here is just so you guys have an idea. So my HDL, which is my good cholesterol, was high. The range is 40 to 59. Mine was 60. So it wasn't like extraordinary high, but it was higher. Um, and my LDL was 88. The range is um, under 130. P, what was yours? Yeah, very similar, actually. But it uh, looks like my, my HDL was 54 and LDL was 89. Okay, so pretty much in the same range there. So now, based on that, Austin, now since my HDL was high, technically I can handle more lipids in my diet, right? Uh, so you know, HDL we've have found it to be a protective risk factor uh, to heart disease. So in your case, with with yours being you know a little bit high, it essentially it means yeah that uh, any kind of cholesterol that uh, gets inside of your vessels a lot of times is is able to be kind of transported and uh, it's what's called a protective risk factor. So you got essentially you just got one of the biggest things that that de- uh, determines what uh, people's HDL is 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 genetic. I mean that's one of the bigger things as far as uh, HDL uh, you know and, and cholesterol is if you know you got good genes that a lot of times the HDL helps to you know kind of take the whole lipid panel and just make it a little bit better, which, you know, and, and a lot of things like exercise help you know, a whole lot with uh, HDL levels being high. So 60 is perfect. I mean, that's a good level. So that, does that mean that I can, so basically our fats are around the same, me and P. I think we're about, P, where are you up to, right? I'm around like 80, 90? 75, 80, so maybe my Yeah, so we're about the same. Yep. So if we wanted to, based on our blood work, our LDL is low, so 88. And our HDL is high. We could basically raise our fat up a little bit and kind of quote unquote get away with it and have more fat to use if we wanted to. If we wanted to raise our, if we were trying to gain weight or whatever, we could definitely increase our fat a little bit based on just our blood work. Again, our snippet in time. Yeah, I mean, you go get some bulletproof coffee. <laughs> 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 no, but yeah, in, in general, yeah, uh, a little bit extra fat. Uh, you, you got the the lipid panel to support it. As far as it, you have a little bit of wiggle room that you could up your fats a little bit. It's so funny because you know, especially you know, I'm a personal trainer, so I hear this all the time. And people ask me about eggs. You know, oh, I gotta eat egg whites. I'm like, oh, but you can eat the whole egg. You just gotta fit it in. You know, and yeah. no one really understands the concept. Like before, I had this blood work done. I was actually telling Peter, I was like, ah, oh, shit. You know, I forgot I was getting blood work done. <laughs> you know, right before the day before, I had six whole eggs, cheese, like all this like like quote unquote fattening, like like you know, heart attack stuff. And and you can see my results of my blood work. And I have, I generally have like six six eggs a day. You know, so and a lot of people think, you know, if you're listening to this, like, oh, my God, his cholesterol is through the roof. And you, as you can see, you know, well, obviously, genetics aside, you know, if you live a healthy lifestyle, more than likely, a lot of that stuff isn't bad for you. It's usually your lifestyle that will make it bad for you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that, it, you're right on with that. It, I mean, this is definitely where the, the paleo CrossFit community tries to, you know, lay their, their claim to fame. And, you know, obviously, you don't want to, you know, pound, you know, the butter and cheese and, you know, eggs like that. But, 
Yeah, I mean, you're you're getting you know good healthy source of, of fats. It, finally, we've you know debunked that myth as far as you know saturated fats and you know having it in a decent moderation is is good. It's probably what we were intended for in the first place. So, uh, you know, with based on with your cholesterol panel, yeah, it, it definitely makes sense that it looks the way that it does. And I wouldn't stop eating eggs. I mean, that's definitely it, it's, it's crazy that that still you know that was like back from like the 70s research and yeah, still we're still up. dealing with the, the aftermath of that as far as well I, I had like four pieces of toast instead and and well they uh, my old doctor told me that my i needed to stop eating eggs and avocado i thought well eh, okay <laughs> well you're diabetic but that you know, doesn't help you yeah exactly exactly so maybe if i up my fat my testosterone i'll become a man again yeah, maybe, maybe so. And then we can write Pete. Then we can write an ebook about it and sell it online <laughs> and make money. <sure. laughs> exactly. All right. So now this this question is exactly for my co-host here because he's dealt with this before. So what exactly is cortisol, and how does intense strength training affect cortisol levels? So Pete, you want to give a little background story here before you answer the question? Yeah, sure. So um, going back to the original blood work that I had done when I was post contest, um, feeling just the effects of dieting and contest prep. Uh, I went to the doctor and I felt a few different symptoms. I felt number one issue I was going there was just low libido, chronic fatigue, and just a sense of fatigue all over, you know, um, just tired, didn't want to train. Mood was not the greatest. And, um, you know, I, I initially said that it must be low testosterone. So when I went to the doctor, I said, I want to get testosterone levels checked. I think that that's the issue. And I want to make sure they're in the normal range. So I had gotten that blood work done. Uh, blood work came back. Like I said, doctor pointed out everything looks normal. Testosterone looks normal. And he said cortisol is high. So he attributed those symptoms to the high cortisol. And again, which I found kind of odd was my, like I said, low libido. I assumed right away that meant low testosterone. And he said that could even be part of the high cortisol. So he attributed that as the issue. And that was the thing he said we needed to fix. His advice to me was just rest. That was pretty much the best advice I got. Um, but that was all I got from it. And I'm still curious. This is kind of like an unsolved mystery. Again, like I said, I, I fixed the problem eventually. And it was really just a time thing. Uh, I had to give my body more time to just kind of recover. Um, but I still don't know. And I'm curious if the high cortisol levels actually was the reason that I had felt like that, you know, especially considering testosterone was still normal. So that's that's really where I'm curious about the the cortisol numbers and what they mean as far as, you know, strength training, because my initial response was I'm assuming that the high cortisol levels is related to the intense strength training that I was doing at the time. I was doing a lot of cardio, but just in general, heavy weight training, I figured had something to do with it. So this was back in 2011, right? Yes, and at that point, you were about 21 and three weeks out of a contest, right? That was actually three weeks post-contest. So I actually still didn't feel recovered. Okay. Even though I had started resting, you know, the cardio was definitely significantly tapered. The intensity in the gym was tapered a little bit. And the diet was, you know, I was eating a lot more and resting more, but still didn't feel recovered yet. Yeah, okay. Well, so, you know, with, with cortisol levels, it's... Uh, you know, something that, you know, the whole reason that we have access to it to be able to actually draw labs from it, it and, and look at it is, is that it's associated with a lot of diseases that, you know, you have a, a pathologic reason that you're, you know, giving out too much cortisol. And, you know, it essentially is a, uh, it's, a, it's a type of steroid hormone uh, that it, the adrenal gland produces it. And it's, it's another thing that, you know, we want in our bodies. It's another thing that gets kind of bastardized in the, the fitness community as far as, oh, my cortisol is, is high and therefore I'm having difficulty losing weight. And, uh, and, and it's definitely one of those labs that it uh, is one of the biggest things that, you know, having it at certain types on time of the day, uh, different factors as far as how long that you've been up. It's, it is such a variable lab. If you, I mean, it has so many, such a wide range in, on, on the reference range. And it depends on, even on the reference range, when you get the labs back, it'll say, okay, well, if, was this a morning blood draw or an afternoon blood draw? And, uh, you know, that's still not, I, I wouldn't say scientific enough to be able to say, well, that you, yes, you have high cortisol. So, you know, when we're actually 
trying to, to grab these tests for, you know, looking into some of the bad diseases like Cushing's disease that, you know, are associated with, with high or low uh, cortisol. Uh, Cushing's is high cortisol. Uh, a lot of times we're getting more kind of uh, intense labs as far as like a, a 24-hour urinary assay of the, the cortisol, or even there's like some saliva variants that you can get. So, you know, the one that the assay of just like, what is my cortisol right now? It, it is one of those things where, yeah, 10 minutes later, it could have been, you know, a little bit higher, a little bit lower. So, you know, with yours and your symptoms, that's where I would say, yeah, you know, your, your doc, whether you liked him or not, he probably no, was I on. Didn't, to... I didn't like him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, whether you liked him or not is, is definitely, uh, uh, I would say it, he's right. And, and, you know, you had a high, hey, let me ask you a question. When you went to the doctor, were you wearing a lot of pants? <laughs> No, I wasn't. You think that would have helped it be a little bit lower? <laughs> yeah. Testosterone definitely would have been lower. That's oh, for sure. For sure yeah. Those tight ass pants, man. Your nuts can't breathe. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I'm, I'm actually I'm really curious to hear this because I, I'm I'm wondering if it actually, you know, if if th if that could have been something that, what if he was on to, you know, what was causing the issue? Well, so like you know, based on you know, so so we got to look at exactly. I said you know, we we need that cortisol to actually function. So what it actually does in our in our bodies is is essentially is when your body perceives any kind of threat, and you know, we usually call that just stress. Uh, you know, whether that's you know major emotional stress or physical stress or. Uh, you know, you, you work in a super high demanding exertional type of job uh, or even, you know, you, you have some sort of derangement like you, you go super hypoglycemic for some reason or another. Uh, your, your body releases this cortisol and, and pulses to, to try and raise up your, your blood sugars afterwards. Uh, and, and so it has all of these downstream effects like any other hormone would. But so, you know, it increases your blood sugar. Uh, and, you know, it causes the liver to, to break down uh, products to, to make your glucose go a little bit higher. And then it also blocks a lot of the inflammatory substances. And, uh, you know, a lot of the, you know, how, how you guys kind of refer to it, I think, is, is the best way is as far as, you know, nutrient shuttling or uh, uh, macronutrient. Uh, I forget what the name that you guys use was. But, uh, yeah. Exactly. Partition. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that. That's definitely one of the factors that goes into it because, you know, this is kind of the thing, one of the hormones that counteracts insulin. So you have, you know, it's kind of like the, the antagonist to insulin and it kind of does uh, all the stuff in, in reverse. So, you know, based on uh, with Big Pete and you, how you were feeling, number one, that the, the contest prep, you, I mean, you, you went hard enough that you caused your body to, uh, you know, see that, okay, I'm, I'm stressed out. I'm, you know, worn down enough that, I'm going to have to release this stress hormone to try and, you know, force myself to get more substances on board to to help recover. So, you know, that's what it's doing. It's it's serving a purpose, but you know, you definitely it I wouldn't say it's the the cortisol necessarily that was making you feel like shit, but it was probably more uh, just kind of a harbinger of that you, your body literally was just to the point where it's so run down that it's saying, "Okay, I'm I'm, you know, spent." So, so let let, let me give off this stress hormone to try and recuperate some of my, you know, my function, my normal function. So, and then it just, you know, kind of took time for your body's thermostat to reset essentially. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, that, that's pretty much what it comes down to what I, you know, kind of concluded at the end. And that's the biggest thing um, that a lot of people don't talk about where it's really was for me and, and for a lot of people that I do know, um, there's that time period where it's just a transition period. So, Everyone thinks the second they're done with their contest prep or their diet, okay, now I'm cutting down the cardio, I'm increasing the food, and I'm resting. Now I'm going to feel better. But it took almost just as long uh, transitioning from that back to yeah. normal as it yeah. did to get in that position in the first place. So, you know, a three- or four-month contest prep, I had to go through a three- or four-month three or four month recovery period of just, just until I felt normal well, again. Well, when it's that severe. I mean, remember, contest yeah. prep is very different than, yeah. you know, just a normal person's diet. You know, Austin, you just lost 20 pounds working with us in a relatively short time. But it's going to take your body a little time to recover from that once we're done. Once we hit our goal, where we're going to be, we're going to reverse your diet, add some calories back in to be able to maintain that weight on higher calories. But it's going to take your body some time to kind of, quote, unquote, get back to baseline yeah. from that point. Because yeah. remember, yeah. your body's changing, you know. So you lost 20 pounds of, of extra luggage, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and I mean, that's, it makes a whole lot of sense as far as why people, 
you know, pack on weight, especially post contest as, as far as, you know, their bodies are literally primed to, you know, pack on fat because you just went through essentially a, you know, pretty unnatural state of, you know, re restricting yourself, you know, strategically enough to have, you know, peeled glutes and, and, you know, look like you do on stage. Exactly. So, you know, I think this is good. You know, I have one more question, but it's not, it's kind of not blood work related, but just, just for the simple fact that I think that a lot of people overlook the blood work. I mean, myself included, I looked at my testosterone level when I got it and I was like bummed out for a couple of days. I'm like, yeah, you know, I know this means I'm getting older. I don't, I don't want to get older. You know, this is not good. I'm, I'm becoming a woman, you know, but overall, like you said, and I think the takeaway messages from is just that this blood work is just a snapshot in time. It's not the end all be all. And again, I, I'm, the leanest I've ever been, the biggest I've ever been, the strongest I've ever been. So it's not like I'm not making improvements. And that that thing is just a number. You know, testosterone yeah. is just a number. And all these things are just a, a number. If you can't control them with your diet, you know, don't don't stress too much about them. Because then your cortisol is going to go high and then you're going to be like, <laughs> <laughs> But let's move on to the last question. So we hear this one all the time. And this is good because now you have a nutrition background. So now you can fully answer this question, my friend. <laughs> too much protein is bad for the liver and kidneys. What seems to be the definition of quote unquote too much? Some people are afraid of overeating um, the RDA's limit for protein, which is like 50 grams for male, which is ridiculous, uh, while other people overconsume protein. So kind of where's the limit there? And should people be worried about protein and the kidneys and liver? I mean, it, it's crazy that the RDA, I mean, like our, you know, quote, source of, you know, intelligence, it set the, the level of uh, 50 grams for, I mean, that's, so you know, I think what they're they're talking about is is mainly uh, is is in order to like survive and and you know over the course of you know as far as just surviving, fifty grams is like at the very very minimal baseline. But oh man, uh, it, it, so the biggest thing first of all, uh, you know, I, you you guys have have I think laid out the perfect uh, guideline as far as you know, what, what the listeners should be listening to as far as, you know, about a gram per, uh, per, is it pound or is it kilogram? Y'all go pound, per right? Pound. Yeah, pound. per pound. You know, and, one and, of the things that I'm going to cut you off quick, really quick, Austin, you know, one of the things I had my degree in nutrition also, and one of the things why I was kind of deterred from going all the way with it was because it's mostly set for a hospital background and just, it was like, you know, making kitchen, you know, the diets for yeah, people in the yeah. kitchens at, and that was kind of one of the things I was like, oh, that's not what I want to do. But, right. um, you know, so one of the things I think that it's, it's always a little bit behind fitness. I feel like fitness is a little bit ahead of the RDA as far as like the average person. Yeah. 50 grams is, is sim simple for the average person to get. But I think this is why we have such an obesity epidemic epidemic in, uh, in the United States, because, you know, 50 grams of protein, you could get that from not even a protein source. If you go to McDonald's once a day, you can easily get 50 <laughs> grams of protein just from just from McDonald's. You know what I mean? So this is the problem. If the RDA would raise that to, let's just say, 100 at least, you know, that, that would make things significantly different, I think. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, I, I probably couldn't necessarily think of a, an example where – even with like kidney issues uh, where a hundred grams per day isn't going to be acceptable for, for most people. I mean, is it, is it the number one thing that's, you know, fueling our, uh, our obesity epidemic? Oh God. I mean, that is definitely, you know, I mean, uh, one thing, I mean, it, this is something that, you know, a lot of the, the younger medical profession kind of, you know, you, you have to take guidelines and everything in, in a, in a, with a grain of salt. And a lot of times we'll call it, Oh, that's just OXA. So old guys sitting around and, you know, I mean, you've got a kind of picture of what, what these guys are, you know, probably actually doing is, you know, it's a big conference and, you know, they're, they're trying to examine all of the, all the medical studies and come out with, you know, one position that we can take as a, as a community to say, okay, this is what we need to be doing. And, and I mean, good God, I mean, the, yeah, you know, medical people are, you know, smarter than the average folk that is just, you know, Googling, but I uh, think. yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, but, you know, I mean, we, we don't have all the answers and, you know, research continues to evolve on a regular basis. So, you know, I mean, a lot of times it's it's essentially what the, the most up to date research is that we that we can go off of. But, oh, man, guidelines are traditionally at least a decade behind. I mean, as we're seeing with yeah. the whole saturated fat thing that we we're talking about earlier, I mean, that was old school advice not to, you know, to avoid saturated fat at all costs. And, you know, it definitely did wreak a, a havoc on, you know, our waistline as, as far as in, in general society. 
So if I if I overeat a gram of protein per pound of body weight, so if I weigh 200 pounds for argument's sake, make this easy, and I eat you know 220 grams every day, am I gonna have bad kidneys and liver? Uh, not at all. No, I mean the, so it. So what I think of in in terms of protein is is it's essentially it's kind of like uh like you're building a house. So it's all of the lumber that's needed for building a house. So, you know, whenever you're making your plans to, to build the house and you want to build it up, you got everything ready to go and you kind of have the truck bring in all the lumber and it's sitting there and, you know, you might have a few extra on hand. And if you have, you know, a few scraps that you're going to end up, you know, tossing away, that's completely fine. And, and that's kind of the same thing with protein is, you know, we want it on board enough of the time uh, to, to have enough to, to build uh, as far as, you know, build muscle and, and, you know, repair tissues. Cause you know, that's essentially all it is just you know, all the am- amino acid, you know, it's just the, the building blocks for, for muscle tissue. So, you know, as long as we have enough on board, uh, that number in, in general, like we said, is, you know, we're going to kind of, you know, rely on about, I think a gram per pound, uh, just regular body weight, not just lean body mass, but, you know, all on body weight, uh, you know, even up in that, uh, you know, 1.5 upwards of 1.5, as long as there's no underlying kidney damage should be completely fine. You know, that, that, and that's the main thing as far as when people say, oh, too much protein is bad for the liver and kidneys. Well, it, not necessarily as long as they're working appropriately like they should and you're not, you know, taking fireballs all the time. Exactly. So being fat is also bad for the liver and kidneys. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I think, I think a gram per pound is, is solid. And then, you know, it depends on what your goals are, too. If, if it's muscle building, preserving muscle, even bumping that up is appropriate. So now on the opposite end of the spectrum, there's people I'm sure that listen to this that consume way too much protein. So let's say, uh, I don't know, let's use me again as an example, you know, 200 grams. I, I weigh 200 pounds. Let's say I'm having uh, 300 to even around 400. Is there an effect there? Oh, I mean, so, I know it's a tough question. I know it's a tough question to answer, but you get kind of what I'm asking. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Is, is that like, in all honesty, is that is that how high you've gone? Uh, I mean, in the past, I've have had protein like 350. I have had that. Pete, what about you? Yeah, I've done about. I mean, this is very early on when I first started, and it wasn't for a significant period of time. But I've there's definitely been periods where I've done about 300, 350 grams, and. I don't know what the blood work would have said, but as far as how I felt, it was definitely not adding any benefit and just making, it was just destroying my stomach. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Yeah, so, you know, I think that's that's the the biggest thing is, uh, essentially is uh, how much, as far as like a a long-term deleterious health effect, if you were eating 400, you know, grams of, of protein for, you know, years, you probably would start to see some sort of uh, derangement in, in your in your kidney function first, and uh, your liver enzymes might be partially elevated as well. But you know, a lot of times your your body's essentially just pooping it out, and so you know you're just kind of wasting your money on uh, you know protein powders and and everything else to to you know once you go above that generally you know defined term was uh, you know once you're going above that then you're kind of wasting your money and you're essentially just kind of excreting it most of the time now i mean some of it still uh, is is you know circulated and uh, but as far as too much I, I think there's a reason that you know the medical community all the the research academics can't say okay that's the number that's too much is because it it depends it's different and you know most of the time eh, hell you're 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 probably fine even going up to 400 for even a year or so but you know it's it's just depends on on what that person uh, as far as their underlying you know kidney function and you know is your body healthy enough to excrete it if you got too much on board Great, man. Austin, this was a wonderful conversation. I'm super glad we did this. I'm glad. I hope that you guys learned from our little case study here because I think it was good that we actually pulled out our blood work and we pulled it out and used it as an example for you guys because I think these are things that most fitness people look for and the simple fact that we went through each one, I think it'll help a lot of people because, again, like I said, I was freaking out when when I heard that. After our conversation, I'm freaking out a lot less. So, Austin, thank you again for coming on. What I'm going to do, guys, I'll add Austin in our New York Muscle Radio group. If you guys have any, like, follow-up questions for him, and this guy's a doctor, so we're not going to bother him. But if you guys have any further questions, I'll add him to our New York Muscle Radio group, and then uh, you guys can ask him a question there. But, Austin, if anybody is curious to reach out for you, where can they find out more about you? Maybe if they live in Austin area, maybe they want to come see you. Because I wish you lived in New York, man. You'd be, definitely be my doctor. <laughs> yeah, man. I, it, I mean, why don't you guys move away from New York? You just work out all day. and I mean, you could save yourself a lot of money. I was always no, wondering. dude, I'm not even kidding, man. I would love to move to Texas. I have three places I would love to go. 
Texas, Florida, and California. One of those three. And I, honest, and all honestly, I would love to come to Texas. One for the steak, too. <laughs> Dude, I got a spare bedroom and a garage gym. So, I mean, you're good to go. You bring the whole family. <laughs> oh, there you go. There you go. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you, buddy. <laughs> no, but where I mean, we, where I are we going to put Pete? We can put him outside with the cattle. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll make do somehow, one way or the other. <laughs> Just throw me some uh, steak. But- I'll be okay. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah, that's right. Uh, but you know, I don't really have a brand or anything, and I'm just you know a regular guy just you know, living his life. And uh, you know, so I mean, I am on uh, Instagram, uh, A Town Marshall, I think is is my username. Uh, but Facebook, you know, if, if anyone has any you know general overall medical questions, uh, happy to to answer. I mean, I can't necessarily you know give out 100 percent advice with without kind of you know, taking you on as a patient, but, you know, in, in general, I don't mind, you know, answering in generalities and, uh, you know, helping answer any other questions that might come up on the boards. Yes. Perfect. All right, guys, go Pete, your turn. All right, guys, Pete and Anthony with Austin Marshall, New York Muscle Radio, and we're out. Enjoy this episode of New York Muscle Radio. Make sure to hit that subscribe button, leave us a five-star review, and be sure to follow us on Facebook, New York Muscle Radio.